Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm so glad to see such a, a large audience on a, on a basketball night, of all things, even. So thank you for coming. I'm Neil Lerner. I'm, I'm a professor in the music department, and I teach a course on film music every year. And, and one of the real pleasures of teaching this course is that every time I do it, and I've been doing this since Ethan moved into the Charlotte area 15 years or so ago, I, I've had Ethan Ethan Uslan come in a company, a silent film, sometimes just for the class, but more recently I've, I've been making a public event because it's just, it's too good not to share it. And uh, he's, he is one of the, the top ragtime players in the world, having won several ragtime competitions all over. Uh, he performed last year at Ravinia and got rave reviews there. So if you haven't heard him before, uh, he's an exciting, really fun pianist and I'm sure it'll be a treat. It's, it's a real unusual thing in this day to find somebody of Ethan's pianistic ability who also knows about early film accompanying. And this is really a lost art, and Ethan is, is one of the few people around who's still keeping that art alive. So until, until mechanized sound recording happens in the late 1920s, music with a film would have been done live. And, and it's done in all sorts of different ways, and it might have just been a piano, or a piano, and a percussionist, or an organ, or even an orchestra in, in a big city. But it, it, sometimes the pieces were improvised, sometimes they were written out, sometimes they were sort of planned with improvisation as well. So Ethan's done a little bit of both for us. He's actually come up with a cue sheet for, for the film. He's, he's, you know, he's gone through the film, he's thought about what music he wants to do where, but there'll be certain things that he'll catch as it's happening too. Um, just to give you a sense of what was going on with film music around this time, there's a pretty infamous article among film music scholars called Jackass Music, because it's got donkeys in the little cartoons up there, from 1911, from Moving Picture World. So Moving Picture World was a, a periodical that would go to people that were showing films as their business, and it would give you tips on things to do and not to do. And this one is very much in the category of things not to do. So the Jackass Music article is a, a series of things that this writer thought were wrong with the way that some people were accompanying music in the early 19-teens. And it goes through and it, it names a number of different characters. So Lily Limprist is one of the characters. Um, Oh, what a noise when the lights are turned low and Lily Limprist takes her place at the usual instrument of torture. With a self-conscious smirk, she gives a poke to her back switch, dabs her side, teasers with both patties, rolls up her sleeves and tears off that Yiddisher rag. She bestows a clam smile on the box of candy young man in the, in the first row, but the presentation on the screen fails to divert her I see you glances anymore than if it was the point of a joke. So one of the things that Lily Limperis does that this writer doesn't like is become distracted by people who are there in attendance. And there's, there's one of the other uh, caricatures. So this is Lily Limperis accompanying in a film. There's a death scene. There's a sad death scene happening on the screen. But she's playing, has anyone here seen Kelly, which is a fun little drinking song and stuff. So she's playing an inappropriate piece because she's making eyes with the gentleman friend that's sitting there in the audience. Um, the performance of Lily Limperist, the writer says, is a poetic dream compared to the diabolical dipsomania of Freddie Fuzzlehead and Percy Peashaker when they cut loose between the vaudeville acts, so like vaudeville acts. And, and something important to remember, at this time, if you went to see a movie, it would have been in a Nickelodeon, it would have been not just movies that you would have seen. You would, you would see a short movie, might maybe a couple, but it would alternate with live acts as well. And there might be an illustrated song slide, might be a sing-along. Singer would sing and then whole group, everyone there could sing in the chorus. The slide would have the words. It was a way that Tin Pan Alley could promote new pieces of music and try to market it. There might be comedy routines, there might be dancing. So that's, that's the reference to vaudeville. So you have Lily Limperist and Freddie Fuzzlehead and Percy Peashaker. We find out a little bit more about Percy. Uh, when there's water in the picture, it goes to Percy's cerebrum. So Percy is guilty of being too literal 
when, when things happen and makes sound effects that signal everything that this writer thinks we don't need. If there's a lake shown on the screen, no matter if it's a mile away, calm or stormy, he shakes his box of peas so that we may know that it is principally made of water. Realism becomes intense when a vessel appears and Percy blows a whistle, ooh, ooh, to enforce the fact that it is a steamer and not a full rigged ship. Bow wow indicates that we are looking at a dog and not a doormat. Honk honk gives one a thrilling remembrance of crossing Broadway after the theater with 50 cowboy taxis in full pursuit. And he is a master of such startling effects as clapping two blocks of wood together when an old nag candidate for the glue factory trots along a country road. So this is Percy P. Shaker, guilty of of being too literal at times and capturing everything with some sort of sound effect. And finally, one of the other offenses that Percy P. Shaker could do is, is to, to hit the percussion and do things during moments where it's just inappropriate. And, and at the end, the writer recommends that if the drummer cannot be taught to subordinate his morbid craving for attention to the general effect, Cut him out altogether and pay more for a pianist who can improvise softly during scenes of pathos or utilize operatic selections for the dramatic effects. And they go on and say bang, -a bang, bang, bing, bang, bang. So this idea of just hitting, hitting the snare drum and having percussion effects as, as a sad, pathetic scene is happening on the screen. So luckily, um, the nickel admission, the price of admission to the Nickelodeon, we didn't even charge you that. Um, and we've got, but, but with the, you know, we, we're paying the money that we would have paid to a Percy P. Shaker, and we've got an amazing improviser and pianist who is, is going to improvise softly during scenes. I don't know if he's going to pull any opera in, but he'll probably pull in some other familiar pieces. So it's a relatively short film. Ethan wants to come and play a couple of pieces before, and then he'll accompany the film, and then I'd like to have a minute or two to take questions. And um, so if, if you're just curious about what he's doing or how this works, we can talk about it for just a little bit, but that's what's gonna happen. So thanks again for coming out.
the movie's pretty short, I'm gonna do another overture. <laughs> um, and this is uh, what I call, uh, I'm gonna put, you know, O oh, Susanna, Stephen yeah. Fox's O oh, Susanna, I call this O oh, Susanna the movie. Because it's a movie <laughs> that exists in my mind. So I'm gonna tell you what happens in the movie and then you can follow along with the music. Then we'll do a real movie. All right, it starts out, you know the song has the man with the banjo on his knee? So he's playing the banjo, and Susanna's there, and she's dancing, and they're in the parlor, and they're happy, they're in love, um, and they're dancing, and well, she's dancing, playing the banjo, and then um, they look out the window, and there's trouble brewing, because it's the Civil War, and then you see the Confederate Army, and then you, the Union Army, <coughs> you know, converging, and um, and then there's a battle, and then during the ensuing chaos, I didn't say it was a good movie, uh, during the, the ensuing chaos, uh, the, the bad guy with the turned up mustache snatches Susanna and ties her to the railroad tracks, and then you have to uh, listen to hear if she gets rescued at the end. So here is Oh Susanna, the movie. <laughs>
real movie, Charlie Chaplin, The Cure. Thank you, projectionists. <laughs> Thank you.
That was so much fun, Ethan. Thank you so much. So 
Um, I want to ask you some questions. I'm just, can you tell us how you do this? So you didn't have music in front of you, right? I had one song, the love, the love song. I put uh, put out in front of me because uh, I didn't know it by heart, and I thought it would be funny to play that love song. <laughs> and uh, I kind of have, you know, set uh, in my mind. I have like genres, you know. Goofy music um, and uh, jazz music, like dainty music and bad guy music and love music, you know. And I can, when I do movies, I kind of interchange, and I and um, and I think, you know, if just a song that I I've been playing. I think, oh, that would be good uh, love music. That would be good, you know, silly music, things like. And so I made a little set list because, um, you know, I turned 40 and I can't, like what happens, like I, I know so many songs, but then I'll sit down and I can't think of anything. Uh, and so I made a, you know, a list of some good songs that would be, be good to play, kind of like a cue sheet, cheat sheet. <laughs> But those weren't, so starting around 1911, films began to be distributed with, with cue sheets. It becomes a whole industry into itself. And so they would be a, a list of suggested pieces. So what you're doing is really authentic. And you know, the better movie houses, the pianist would see the film in advance maybe. So it seems like you'd seen it because I was just marveling at how closely you were capturing you know, the gestures happening on screen and you were you were at, I watched it right before I came. <laughs> but even, <laughs> it was fresh in my mind. <laughs> but still, I mean, that, that, so you've got to be paying pretty close attention to what's happening on the screen and watching that, but also thinking about the music. I mean, that, that's where it, it's a different skill than just being a good piano player, right? Thanks. I, I get, you know, I'm looking for love, you know, I'm looking for some action. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it took a it took a weird revolving door turn right there. Huh. Question and answer period. So. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, I'm looking for the different 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 cues. <laughs> In all the wrong places. I, any anyone out there have any questions? Yeah. Um, I, I've been doing this for many years and um, I do whatever films I'm requested to do. Although now, as I said, I'm turning 40, I'm beginning to turn down films. Like, if they're not good. I said, there's nothing I can play to make this movie good. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, now I only do films that I think are watchable. Because they're not all watchable. Um, what was the other question? There was other question in there. Sorry. I'm uh, over oh, 40, so oh, I don't <laughs> Oh, rough. Um, so, um, I think you also asked if I always make cue sheets. Oh, yeah. by, and and um, I usually don't. Um, for dramas, I like to, I used to just do it in my head. I would think of a plan, maybe put a notebook together. Because uh, dramas are more difficult because uh, the music that I usually play is the jazzy ragtime and stuff. Uh, and so I know a ton of that. So if there's a movie where it's just 90% people running around, slipping on banana peels, I can wing it, you know, in some love. I can wing it. But when there's lots of, like, when it's more sophisticated, um, prolonged drama, I need to kind of think about what would work to, to, to do a good job. You said you do a lot of movies. Do you do just all Chaplin, or do you have other choices that you? Um, I've done I've done Chaplin. I've done Buster Keaton. I've done Harold Lloyd. Those are the big comedy guys. Um, and I've done lots of uh, dramas. Um, of course, I can't think of any. Right? <laughs> Sunrise. I've done that's a great one. There's one called Palable David. Nosferatu and, and the uh, 
Phantom of the Opera. And that I plan out to make it, you know, you got to know when the scary part's happening so you can you can surprise people. You can't be surprised. You have to be in with the movie. Yeah. Yes? Um, are there any other names for the OST band? Any other names for it? Like for the song? Does yeah. it go by any other name? Uh, no, I think it's just called O Susanna. Why? Do you do you know by another name? No. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sure people have added new words and maybe changed the name. So maybe you think maybe it should change the name? Maybe. Yes. Well, I was going to ask you, what's your favorite personal piece that you like to play? Uh, my favorite uh, personal piece. Uh, I have, oh, that's hard to say because I'll find something that's my favorite and I'll play it to death and then I hate it. <laughs> um, uh, but um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I was just wondering how much of what you played for us just now was improvised either content wise or as far as when it would happen in the movie? Were there any moments where you just had nothing planned and you just went for it? Uh, yeah, I think there were part, there were things I did that I didn't do when I kind of ran through it before I came today. Like, uh, I got the idea to like, uh, to, to sound more drunk and clash the notes. <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, I kind of, I was I just inspired in the moment to do that. Wonderful. You know, like little things like that. And yeah, I can't play it exactly. This It's really a rough rough sketch and, and, and uh, there were some, I, like if I did it again, it would be, you know, there were, you would see some things that were similar, but a lot of details and that's published uh, before 1922, so it's actually legal to, to go and get it. It's all public domain, just to get that in there. Yes, in the back. Hi. Um, I was struck by uh, a number of points in the film where literally the, um, where you were at in the, in the phrasing, a, the gesture of a phrasing of something musical um, effected what otherwise we might get as like a sound effect in something. So in other words, the phrasing matched up with motions. Um, I'm thinking one place that really struck me was in the massage. When he was doing the massage thing, and you sort of break into, like I'm saying a tango, but I'm, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there were moments where he crouched into a pose, but the exact timing of what you were doing um, was perfectly matched. And is that kind of a, a razor's edge that you have to balance? It when it lines up exactly like that, you know what? I, like, I do try to line things up sometimes, <laughs> but sometimes it's like, have you ever listened to, what is it, The, the Wizard of Oz with Pink Floyd? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just happens to line up and you, yeah. uh, it, but you would be surprised how much things yeah, but but, uh, but I would say, having done this, sometimes I will play and I'll watch them, and I will be amazed how many times things just happen to line up. Um, 
You know, I guess the actions just, they happen with a clear, concise beat, and you know, it, it, it lines up a lot. Um, but, but sometimes it doesn't, and that's okay. You know, like, I don't strive to totally be synchronized. Like, I don't even think that's worth it. You know, that, I think that can be annoying, actually. You know, I, I, I don't know that it was happening with Chaplin or, or, or if any directors were doing it this early, but I know that by the 20s there were some directors who actually liked to film their scenes with a metronome going or actually musicians playing. So sometimes there was a sort of built-in rhythm and pacing to it that the film was made with. So I, I, I don't know that I really sense that here, but it could be that that's part of it too, was Chaplin was just simply thinking of it in that sort of phrased way or something. Pictures. Where they were on the uh, where one one photo where they're on a set and they had a musician on the set, like they they were listening to music as they were acting, shooting. Sure, maybe one more question. I'm able, you know, I, I tried the one of the themes, like I tried to play it in different keys, but I messed up. I just don't feel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of the, I'm not that good at just playing any song in any key, and so usually I find a way to get there. And it can be, I find it can be a very crude transition. It does not have to be the, you know, perfect. Uh, like find the leading tone to the. You know, you can just go, boom, I'm in a new key. <laughs> well, great. Well, um, I'll, I'll ask, you know, we'll, we'll clap for you once more because that was amazing. But I want to, um, before, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, let's hold it, hold it in, hold it in. But I've ruined the moment. Um, but I wanted to say, if, so if, if you want to hear more of Ethan, um, he has a fantastic podcast that's out there. So I, I've listened to a number of those. Those you can go and download. And also this coming Sunday, Sunday afternoon at 4 down at Free Range Brewery down in Noda, uh, he'll be playing for an event sponsored by WDAV. So there are still tickets for sale for that, I believe. And um, there's information on WDAV's website if you want to find more about that. So now let's thank Ethan one final time. Thank you.